I am continuing my video series on ancient Antarctica. This is part 2 of the series. If you feel like you've missed anything, check out the previous video, the link is in the description. I recommend watching it, to get the full picture. Without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. According to reports from travelers, South America and Antarctica were in a dire state when the Europeans arrived. Tribes were in a constant state of war with each other. Cannibalism was widely practiced. Most people were living in wooden huts that were easily burned down by warring tribes, leaving the naked people without shelter. The natives were said to be quick to sell their daughters to the European arrivals in exchange for food. It seemed like they were survivors of a traumatic cataclysm. The discoverer and merchant Amerigo Vespucci, born 1451, after who America was named, sailed to South America, and then to the Antarctic, where he discovered a vast new land that was fertile and populated. Of course, historians have questioned the accuracy of Vespucci's letters, because it doesn't fit in with the veil that was cast around history. The letters of Vespucci contain a detailed account of life in South America and the Antarctic. Vespucci says that Antarctica had more animals than Africa, and that the cannibalistic people lived in very large buildings that could house thousands of people. But while their ancestors built such buildings, when the Europeans met them, they were merely building towns made of wood and straw. It's possible that Antarctica was the legendary land of giants. Ancient accounts say the giants were offspring of forbidden sex between fallen angels and humans, and for this reason they were eliminated in a flood. Maybe, this is why their continent was frozen. Most giants, especially in more ancient times, were hostile to humans. They enslaved and also ate them. There are also plenty of drawings from the 1400s to 1600s, of humans acting as cannibals, perhaps emulating the example of the giants. These are by Theodore de Bry, drawings of South Americans from the 1500s. Six of the seven men in it look alike. All four women look alike. Their hair is red. What was the painter trying to say? All accounts say that they were very well built and musculous, and raged an average age of 150. The next one is by Johann Froskauer, 1505. These cannibals again have red hair and the feathered hats Native Americans are known for. And they are look-alike. Does that point toward inbreeding? Why were these people in such a dire state? I suspect it's because their civilization was destroyed, they were collectively traumatized, and henceforth descended into an uncivilized chaotic state. Travelers both ancient and more recent, have accused the Yagan and Zelpnum of cannibalism. Their own mythology, casts cannibal giants as the villains. Yagan cosmological myths include a story of the Great Flood. Anthropologists and travelers have collected over 60 Yagan stories mentioning the Great Flood, an event that was obviously very important to them. This was in the early 1500s, so, my previous idea that the area was flooded and iced around 1250, is perhaps not the whole story. There must have been several progressive floods that gradually changed Earth's climate and put the Antarctic under ice. Here, for instance, is a 1507 map, showing North America almost completely flooded, except for the Rocky Mountains, unlike earlier maps. News service Reuters said that this map puzzles researchers, because it names America and shows South America, as well as an ocean beyond the two, which it shouldn't. Notice also the pyramid capstone at the North Pole. Tierra del Fuego apparently has undiscovered pyramids of its own. I was lucky to stumble upon a webpage with aerial photos of Tierra del Fuego pyramids. I don't know who runs the webpage, nor how they knew where to look. But I went to verify, and get some screenshots of my own. If you go to Bing Maps and type the coordinates 53.640583 south, 68.414449 west, and the aerial view of the map, you will see this. Close up. The same on Google Earth, a little more obscured, but still, obviously a large pyramid shape. Maps show no special site, building, tourist attraction, township, or even community here, so I'll assume for now, that this structure is ancient, and unexplored, at least by the general public. Here's another one, at the coordinates 53.522329 south 68.487686 west on Bing Maps aerial view.
If we look back at the first map I showed in this topic, you can see that the gigantic Antarctic continent was at one time called Terra Australis. This is a Wikipedia article on Terra Australis. Terra Australis, Latin, Southern Land, was a hypothetical continent first posited in antiquity, and which appeared on maps between the 15th and 18th centuries. Its existence was not based on any survey or direct observation, but rather on the idea that continental land in the Northern Hemisphere should be balanced by land in the Southern Hemisphere. This theory of balancing land has been documented as early as the 5th century on maps by Macrobius, who uses the term Australis on his maps. This entire paragraph is one for the garbage bin. Terra Australis was not a hypothetical land, it was used in world maps, sea maps, and navigation maps, that people relied on as accurate. It wasn't posited, but shown to exist on maps, and reported by travelers. Of course they have to say hypothetical because Antarctica wasn't supposed to have been known in the 15th century, much less in the 5th when Macrobius used it. This is why Amerigo Vespucci's travels are all accepted as authentic, except for his travels to the Antarctic, which are called controversial. Those who have falsified our history won't allow for ancient transatlantic contact, much less an awareness of Terra Australis. Even though it was known, it was often called the unknown land. There must have been something preventing most people to go there, just like today. Was it the land of giants? And was this the main deterrent? Other names for the hypothetical continent have included Terra Australis Ignota, Terra Australis Incognite, the unknown land of the south, or Terra Australis Nondum Cognita, the southern land not yet known. Other names were Brasilia Australis, or the southern Brazil, and Magellanica, or the land of Magellan. Matthias Ringman called it the Or Antarctica, or Antarctic land, in 1505, and Francis Cosmonicus called it the Australis or, or Australis country. In medieval times, it was known as the Antipodes. During the 18th century, today's Australia was not conflated with Terra Australis, as it sometimes was in the 20th century. Captain Cook and his contemporaries knew that the sixth continent, now known as Australia and called New Holland back then, was completely separate from the imagined seventh continent, now known as Antarctica, which had yet to be discovered. The cataclysm that flooded the land and separated Australia from Antarctica, as well as Tierra del Fuego. It is my current view, subject to change, that one of these disasters happened around 1250, another in the 1500s, and another in the 1700s. Captain Cook found a post-cataclysmic Australia. Ptolemy, 2nd century AD, believed that the Indian Ocean was enclosed on the south by land, and that the lands of the northern hemisphere should be balanced by land in the south. Marcus Tullius Cicero used the term Singulus Australis, or Southern Zone, in referring to the Antipodes in Somnium Sapienus, or Dream of Scipio. The land, Terra and Latin, in this zone, was the Terra Australis. Legends of Terra Australis Incognita, an unknown land of the South, date back to Roman times and before, and were commonplace in medieval geography, although not based on any documented knowledge of the continent. Even though Wikipedia is full of inaccuracies, much is learned by reading between the lines. I was surprised to find the Terra Australis was known by 2nd century Ptolemy. I remember learning in school that Antarctica was discovered in the 1800s. And here it says it was already known in the year 200. The last sentence is not very smart. Terra Australis was common in medieval geography, although not based on any documented knowledge of the continent. If there was no knowledge of the continent, why did so many learned people reference it? That would be as if I say, even though people of the year 2001 were all talking about the World Trade Center attack, they had no documented knowledge of it. This image shows the well-known 1513 Piri Reis map. That map, by Turkish navigator Piri Reis, is more than enough to debunk any notion that Antarctica or Terra Australis were known to the ancients. This is Western Hemisphere of the Johannes Schoner Globe from 1520. This is Orenz Fine's 1531 heart-shaped map of the world. Summary. When mainstream academics looks into the past, they find primitive hunter-gatherers and an ice age. Every time I look into the past, no matter where, I find giants, dwarves, cannibals, dragons, flying ships, and floods. It is not wrong that at some points on our timeline, humans descend to survival mode as hunter-gatherers. It's not wrong that there was an age of ice. But the ice age did not begin 2.4 million years ago. There was a drastic event as recent as 400 to 1000 years ago. 
And the hunter-gatherers weren't just that for hundreds of thousands of years, humans went through cycles of great advancement and decline many times. This much is obvious from a comparative and unbiased look at the old maps, reports, and paintings. Knowledge dissemination relies on you. Share this video far and wide.